Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the Riptide. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. Brewers, it's time for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer, this is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Greetings, cretins. <laughs> Welcome to Bruce Strong. Yes, another another cretinous uh, afternoon in the uh, yes in the pandemic of California, where we just we were just discussing our inability to get shot um, outside of you know get stab, stab, yeah 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 it's California for you yeah. Oh, I've, I've actually gotten my my two shots. Um, oh, yeah, both now. Okay, that is just I'm the one. Old, I'm fat. I'm uh, diseased, and I work in the food and agriculture industry. So there you go. I check a lot of boxes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it was actually uh, pretty good. I got the Moderna shot, and uh, nothing but uh, on the first one, I had a little bit of soreness in my arm and. That, that evening, I had a little bit of a headache and uh, felt a little warm. That was it. Hmm. And the second shot, just less soreness in my arm, and that was it. Uh, same thing for Liz. She oh, that's good. Had no, no symptoms of it, just a sore arm. So. Uh, that's what I'm hearing, is the vast majority of people are uh, having no uh, nothing other than a sore arm. So uh, seems to work. Uh, Very good. Uh, and an antibody test, which shows I develop antibodies. Oh, that's good. My pathetic immune system still antibodies. So, yes, it works. I guess I did not get water. I got uh, the actual stuff. Oh. Get the good juice. I encourage people to go out and get their get their vaccines if and when they can. They should. Uh, yep. Regardless of what you think, it's it's going to be the only way we really uh, get out of this this uh, nightmare. Speaking of uh, nightmares, uh, have you seen our, our buddy uh, John Blippen recently? Yeah, I saw him on video the other day. We were prepping for our uh, All Green Essentials boot camp this Friday, nice. so I got I got to talk to him a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna try to do a virtual class with him with a couple cameras in his in his break room. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're they're at the factory showing the equipment and demonstrating brewing. You know, like dipping the camera down in the kettle and so on <laughs> should be good as long as he has his pants on yeah oh yeah as far as we can tell yes right don't want to make other people feel bad you know right uh, but oh uh, that's cool yeah i haven't seen our good buddy john in, in quite a while uh, you know with the the pandemic and stuff all our our stuff is canceled they canceled that well they didn't cancel but the homebrew conference that was in san diego i was looking forward to is now virtual Yep. That was yeah, I mean, it is what it is. What are we gonna do? Right, right. But uh, yeah. hopefully by fall. Hopefully by fall. Maybe, maybe next year uh, we'll get a chance. I, I really want to yeah. go. See Sweden. We got to go back to Sweden. Yes, more more Sweden action. Yeah. Some of these trips, I haven't. I was going every year, and now I haven't been able to go for years. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, last year I got to Sweden and. Then they canceled it while I was there. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll just stay and brew with Thomas for a while. But then lo and behold, you you called me and other people called me and said, hey, they're closing the airports. You better get back here. Right. So <laughs> I was like, get on a plane. <laughs> yeah. So three in the morning, I'm getting up, packing and heading wow. to the airport. Wow. But it worked. Yeah. I actually probably was like, I'll just stay in sweet. That's fine. Go, go live with uh, live with uh, some of my my brewing friends there. Right. right. Yeah. Worst yeah. places to end up for for a while. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Well, and uh, you know, our good friend John Blitman, 
he uh, is paying for the show so you don't have to. Uh, he's been a proud sponsor for quite a while now, uh, pretty much since the beginning. And, uh, if you're looking for a cool uh, brew gear, innovative brew gear, they're always making something new. They're always making some creative. If, if, even if you got some Blickman gear, you, gotta, you do it, do yourself a favor and check out their their website and see what new stuff they have. And if you appreciate that uh, John Blickman has uh, paid for this show for pretty much its inception, so you don't have to, uh, maybe send an email to feedback at uh, BlickmanEngineering.com and tell John how much you appreciate it. Um, and there you go. They got all sorts of good stuff from uh, pro size to small size to from the, the all the bells and whistles to just the the sturdy, dependable quality equipment you need. They got it all. So check them out. Um, today uh, we're going to eventually have uh, Nick uh, uh, on, but. Uh, he, I think it's the time difference between the UK and the US. We've, uh, we had this problem before where the US, we, we apparently do daylight savings at random times during the year. So, um, yeah. it throws the everything. equinox or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it used to be that, you know, first or last Sunday was like the spring forward or spring back. I could remember that. And then they changed it to a different month and like the beginning or the second week. And then all of a sudden it was like in the middle of the month or so. I have no idea. So there you go. Uh, and apparently nobody else does either. So we thought we would uh, uh, dig into some of your uh, questions that you might have. Um, let's see here. Uh, Josh from Wyoming, he, he writes, uh, good evening all. Uh, listen to the old Kit Beer episode from 2010 while kegging my latest Belgian Whit Beer. Really cemented what I have been thinking for a while now. I bought an Anvil Foundry last summer and have been brewing a lot with it recently. Uh, my brew days have been an hour plus longer compared to my old all grain brewing of using a cooler and propane burner. Don't get me wrong, as I absolutely love John Blickman's newest brew rig, but I wonder if I can make great beer without using extract recipes and kit and kilo kits like I first cut my homebrew teeth on. Your old rep episode really solidified my thoughts on this, and I think I might order a few Cooper's kits and some extract kits next time I order some brewing supplies. Great episode. Oh, good. Yeah, I you know I always liked extract uh, pure extract kits. They always did well for me. Um, you know, freshness is a key, of course, mm -hmm. and um, certainly, you know, uh, preparing that in a foundry or other all-in-one, you know, just using it as an electric uh, uh, kettle is um, a good way to good way to go. It certainly saves some time. Um, depending on your voltage, you know, they uh, can take a little longer than a propane burner to heat the wort, and that may, you know, that may be a factor on there right but those things there they're uh they're 230 volt as well as 120 you can run it on either or you right decide on one or they work on both yep yeah so you just got all you have to do is flip a switch makes oh. it easy oh yeah. there you go well that's nice yeah if you're not running a 230 run it on 230 for sure yeah um yeah i remember uh there was a challenge um uh, back in the day where uh, we went head to head. This is a brewing network thing. And I was not allowed, the, the, the limitation on me was I was not allowed to boil anything. <laughs> so, like, okay. Uh, that was, just, I guess, to even it up or something. And so I ended up using uh, an extract kit. And, um, you know, just uh, cold water and extract and fermented it. And um, I over hopped it with, uh, I think, Mosaic or Galaxy or something like that. And that was my downfall. Uh, but as far as fermentation goes, you can take some of those. Um, if you have a really good malt extract kit, you know, some of like the Muntins and uh, 
uh, you know, there's a few others, some of the, you know, uh, mm-hmm. some kits. Yep. Cooper's are good. Mm-hmm. Cooper's, uh, you, uh, just mix those with cold water. If you can work in a sanitary way, um, you'd be shocked at how well that turns out. You, you need good fermentation. You need good yeast, but, um, yeah. really, you know, all, a lot of that stuff has already been boiled and, you know, just cold water and, uh, and some yeast and, and you're off and running. So, uh, yeah, I, re- I remember doing that. I thought, I thought it was pretty good uh, and nothing wrong with it. Like John's saying, it depends on, depends on how much time you have. You know, the, the hobby is more than, you know, doing it with every last detail and you have to do it this way and you have to, you know, buy a bunch of equipment. You have to go all grain. I mean, that can be a lot of fun and something I, you know, enjoyed. But, you know, there's also just the fun of fermenting and, you know, making alcohol, packaging it, carbonating it, you know, sharing it with your friends. As long as it turns out and you, and you enjoy it, it doesn't matter how you got there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for uh, pale beers, you know, for hundred percent wheat beers, um, wheat extract, um, it may just a super tasty lawnmower beer that, um, I, I had no, I, the reason I brewed it extract is I had no complaints on how it tasted. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. So, right. and it was easy. I would, I could have that and I'd have a keg of it for, you know, last me a month or so. I won a bunch of awards, uh, you know, uh, extract brewing. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good way to start. And hey, we got that Brewing Classic Styles book. So you have got extract recipes for every uh, BJCP style at the time. That's uh, right. Yeah. There you go. Uh, let's take a short break. And when we come back, we will have more of your questions right after this. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20-gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your brew easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The brew easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your brew easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new brew easy all-grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new brew easy. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. We're uh, having some fun here. We're waiting on Nick, and uh, <laughs> we're. Uh, Getting some, uh, getting some uh, questions in. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm a little bit discombobulated because of my, uh, you know, tiredness. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Chris is asking, uh, Jamil and John, I have been home brewing for almost a year and I realized the color of my finished beer is usually dark, definitely more desaturated than my online calculator suggests. I'm curious if you have any guesses as to why this might happen. Could there be something in my process? I'm not sure what he means by is usually usually dark and definitely more desaturated. The online calculator is suggesting a color saturation, or um, is it darker than the intended SRM or lighter? I'm not sure. 
His info is all grain stovetop, fairly quick cooling, uh, fermenting on the troop, uh, controlled fermentation. <laughs> yeah, dark and desaturated are you know, the opposites, so it's hard to say which he's experiencing. I've, I ne- I've never paid that much attention to color um, simply because it's, it's not precise and, you know, compared to the actual taste, um, it's not, not important. Um, commercially, I would suppose it's more important. Competition-wise, it's really not that critical either. I mean, you get, you know, if you're in final round of GABF, yes, it's going to be judged. But if it's another competition and it's a good tasting beer and it's a little bit lighter, a little bit dark, you may lose one point. Sure. Uh, if it's off a little bit, uh, the the problem is, I think if it if it appears much lighter than uh, you know people are expecting, especially if it's you know something that's malty or roasty or something like that, they're going to say, "Oh, it doesn't taste malty or watery," regardless of what it tastes like. Mm. In their mind, because the color is lighter, they're going to say it has less malt character, it has less roast character, whatever it might be, and so that. That can really come and come back and bite you at times. True, true. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you're just drinking it yourself, I don't know that it's that much of a problem. I would suggest perhaps that the calculator may be wrong. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, anything in it is, you know, all grain stovetop that. I mean, it may be that he is not getting a good crush on his. Uh, grains that contribute yeah. uh, to the SRM much uh, and that he's not extracting much of the color. Um, that could be. So that's a possibility. Or if he's doing capping and just not getting the residence time right. on the, on the dark grains. Yeah. So that, that might be an issue. Um, other than that, uh, you know, the amount of yeast you pitch, the, the, the strain of yeast you pitch can affect color. Um, hmm. Some of them, you know, more than others. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that it, it's one of the reasons that color is a little bit hard to predict precisely. Um, you know, his comment of desaturated, um, is it that he has a lot of yeast or troop or something like that in suspension or, you know, um, haze in his beers. If, if he does, you know, that haze can make a beer look muddy, but you know, it, the haze reflects light and it can make, can make a beer, uh, a lighter beer look dark, but it can also make a darker beer look light. So it may be he's not getting, um, you know, uh, a clarification of his beer. Beer's not clearing. He's got a lot of uh, uh, material in there and it's reflecting a lot of light. And maybe that's what he means by desaturated. Yeah, that could be. So I would, I, would, I would look at that, you know, is your beer clear? You know, even if it's dark, can you see through it? Um, if you're getting nice, clear beer. Um, then it's not that. And, and if it is, you know, maybe let it settle for a week or two and then, you know, take a look at it again and see if the color is right. I mean, my other thing is, how is he translating this online calculator into actual color? Oh, yeah. Perhaps his perception of what SRM is, is off or, you know, color is off. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's there. That could be a factor, too. There is a color scale inside the cover of How to Brew. Good reference. But not a perfect reference, but a good reference. And then uh, when I was more active in the BJCP, we developed a uh, color chart, had them printed and given out. Those were pretty accurate, too. Yeah, those are good ones. Oh, um, yeah, I would I would maybe take a look at that, maybe purchase some standards. Um, one of the standards I think you can use is Guinness. 
speaking of which, you take some Guinness and then um, oh. you dilute it with water and you, you could make yourself color standards from that. Because um, a known SRM and then a known dilution rate and you can kind of get, get some idea. I think that that's one of the things that happens. So there you go. Yeah, and his and the title of his email was SRM and Vibrancy. So that's what's making me think maybe there's a haze in there that's kind of oh. cut, uh, just reflecting a lot of light, making it look not quite as uh, brilliant a color or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder: if you listen in live, you can uh, actually put some questions in the comments section there, uh, and John will will uh, hopefully uh, catch those for you. Right. <laughs> Dylan writes live nudes. <laughs> Na and K, metabisulfite and oxidation. He says, uh, "Dear John and Jamal, glad I got your attention." You know the live nudes. I, I almost just deleted this. You know when I saw that, I was just like, "Oh, more spam." You know, yeah, Go pretty quick and just select all the spam things and hit delete. But uh, in this case, uh, caught that one. Let's see here. Uh, Dear uh, John Jamal, I'm glad I got your attention. Like many brewers, I'm interested in reducing the amount of oxygen post fermentation. Actually, uh, Nick has joined us. Oh. And we can uh, kind of just do some Q&A and then we'll get on to uh, this show after this hour is done. Let's see. Okay. Many brewers, I'm interested in the amount of uh, reducing the amount of oxygen post fermentation. There are many uh, proposed methods to reducing dissolved oxygen in addition of uh, medical sulfide as an antioxidant seems like a very easy and economical way of achieving lower DO so long as you're not sensitive to sulfide. I'm interested in learning more about this method and also the brewing community's opinion on it. It is so widely used in the wine industry. Why is it not in the craft beer industry, especially with the rise of hop forward beers? Entering beer for competition, do you feel there'd be a hesitation amongst judges knowing that it's been added? It is like blood doping for homebrew. <laughs> Dylan in uh, Wisconsin. What do you think? What do you, what do you th- oh, I think, Nick, you're muted. Hi, gentlemen. How are you? Very oh. good. Yeah, we figured. Uh, it, time change probably messed with you. I don't know if I sent you an email telling you about the time change. We did time change a little while ago, and the UK, I think, has not. No, that's correct. Our time change is starting next weekend. Yeah, so it's messed up. Like every call <laughs> I had with the UK has been messed up <laughs> an hour. So uh, I suddenly had a bit of a panic, and I <laughs> went, um, "Am I late?" So um, yeah, I do apologize. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Anyway, so we we uh, kind of jumped on and started doing some uh, live Q and A, and you get to be part of this. What do you think about using something like uh, metabasulfite to uh, reduce uh, as an antioxidant to reduce uh, DO in, in a packaged beer? I guess. Look, I've never used um, metabisulfite for an antioxidant. I think there are probably better options like uh, absorbic acid that um, uh, would be. Uh, reduce your sulfur levels. The vitamin C. It's probably um, it's probably a far more healthy option to go for, and, mm-hmm. and a more acceptable option. Uh, it's roughly about the same sort of dosage levels, and yep. I think absorbic acid is probably a, a, a better way to go. There's a lot of European brewers who do use um, absorbic acid as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that would be my preference over mm-hmm. over metabisulfide, definitely. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, and I, I would think, uh, you know, if you're entering a competition or something like that, you need to disclose that you've used, you know, in, in the U.S., there's a, a legal limit to you know, 10 ppm. Below, yeah. Below 10 ppm, you don't have to disclose it. Um, but I would I would be very cautious about using it, especially in, in finished beer. Um, it's used in wine more as uh, uh you know, a uh, and a back microbial, isn't it? Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, what what um, we would normally use in a um, what the wine industry uses as an antimicrobial, we the brewers tend to use it as a um, uh, a cleaning agent. Whereas you know, I can I can sense anything over 
pretty much about 10 parts per million on my palate and anyone who has a sensitivity to it as well you can pick anyone who has a sensitivity to metabisulfite they pretty much go bright red as soon as they've ingested it and you see a lot of wine drinkers come out with that right and and the, you know, it. there's other ways of uh you know reducing do in your packaged beer um you know something as simple as uh you know blickman beer gun mm-hmm. capping on foam flooding flooding that bottle just take a long slow flood of co2 through that bottle we tested it here and we were able to get essentially zero uh parts per billion in the in the packaged beer so uh, i i don't know that you really need to uh you know go these these other routes but i've been hearing more and more people asking about the bit of a sulfide for a deal yeah I've <clears throat> I've looked into it a little bit from the MBA side, and uh, yeah, it's not it's really not recommended uh, by you know anyone in the industry. It 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 does work to some extent, but as Nick says, um, there is a flavor component and um, legal ramifications for packaged beer that ascorbic acid vitamin C. Uh, will remove uh, packaged DO um, at you know low doses, uh, and that's probably a, a better way to go if you're if you re- think you really need to limit or eliminate uh, packaged DO. Um, yeah, I've, as you were saying earlier, Jamel, I've never had that many, much problem with it myself, even mm-hmm. entering competitions uh, with just good good bottling practice, right. You know, uh, you could do what uh, our good friend uh, Charlie Papazian does, and that is add cinnamon as an antioxidant to his beers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tiny, tiny bit of cinnamon. I, I, I don't know how much. I think it was something like a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon per five or ten gallon batch, something like that. So, uh, who knows? Well, if yeah. he swears by it, that's, uh, that's, that's the way to go. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. He, does. he said... Uh, I think he says it's in essentially every beer he does. Oh, yeah. Right. I've got the uh, the amount of ascorbic acid here laying around someplace. Uh, one milligram per liter is what it is. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's tiny. Yeah. Tiny. Yeah. And that's all it needs. You can, um, uh, I've, I've done uh, tasting and flavor thresholds with ascorbic acid, um, just making... Um, mixtures uh, up to see where I can taste it. And I I can't taste it all the way up to about five or six parts per million. And then over that, then I start getting a little bit of a taint of something into it, but not much beyond that. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's take uh, another short break. And when we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. All right, we're back. I want to remind you guys of our other sponsor, uh, Brew Chatter. Uh, good folks in uh, near Reno, Nevada. Um, they have uh, a great place there and lots of great ingredients. If you if you need anything from ascorbic acid to uh, metabasulfite to <laughs> liquid beer in, they got it all. Uh, great people. They've got a uh, uh, really cool setup there. They've got a, a nice bar when you go in. You could uh, have a pint of uh, any number of beers while you shop, or you shop online. Uh, and as I said, great folks, lots of good information, uh, real, real kind and uh, good friends of the show. Uh, so check them out, uh, brewchatter.com. Say, tell Josh and RJ I sent you. Uh, they're good folks, good, good friends of mine. Okay, we've got one here from the, the chat, uh, Jamil. Tomas says, hello, guys. I'm taking part in Best Brew Challenge 2021 and need to brew a delicate wheat beer. Um, the challenge is to brew a light Hefeweizen. The beer must have at least 20% of best Heidelberg wheat and, of course, 50% of wheat malt in t- the total grain bill. Um, another limit is that the beer must not be stronger than 3.5%. I'm going to use WLP 300. What would you suggest uh, for such a delicate beer in terms of mash and fermentation? Yeah. I think, um, 
Uh, you know, for, for a light Hefeweizen, I guess I, guess I wouldn't recommend decoction. Uh, might over darken it or. Yeah. Um, you know, mash for me, I go single infusion. I don't, you know, but if you want to do like a, a ferulic acid rest and, you know, get more, you know, if you want a lot of Hefeweizen uh, character, clove, banana, things like that, you know, um, you could do that as well. Um, you know, do a protein rest, do it, you know, step mash and then uh, ferment at, uh, uh, I like to start cold and then raise from there. So I was always a fan of starting around uh, 62 uh, Fahrenheit and uh, bringing it up to, you know, 68, uh, uh, maybe as yeah. high as 70 towards the end. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a blank canvas there. Uh, I don't know. What about you, Nick? Yeah, um, so um, as far as start temperatures, definitely starting off that cold side, 17, 17 degrees centigrade. Um, I'm sh- unsure of the, uh, the Fahrenheit conversion off the top of my head for that one. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then letting, letting rise uh, to uh, 20 over the space of you know, a, a, long, a longer period, so about a five day. I was actually just looking at this one this morning and I was um, hoping to pick John's brains a little bit on that, which was the, um, the water profiles, which uh-huh. you normally go for a, a slightly chloride um, uh, heavy just to give that little bit more of a, a softer malt um, component into it. The um, wheat beers, when they do ferment out, especially with the, the 300, can um, be a little bit sharp if you get your water chemistry wrong. And I've been leaning towards... Um, trying another one uh, with not not much more, but um, definitely leaning towards sort of a, a maltier maltier profile with a, a slightly chloride heavy um, heavy base. I don't know, John, if you got any. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point to bring up. Um, I for a, for a wheat like that, uh, where you're not hop, you know, it's not a hoppy beer. I would go with uh, fifty max sulfate and a um, hundred. Yeah, maybe even 150 chloride, uh, depending yeah, on the hot well. taste too. Yep. And then maybe um, let the get and use uh, kosher salt as one of your salts and get the sodium up to like 50, 75, uh, somewhere in there. Because I, again, you know, we, we tend to uh, poo poo. Uh, sodium just because we don't want everything else to get too minerally but you know if you're talking about accenting a malty beer sodium chloride table salt does it yeah yeah we go through a ton of salt now that we're making all these hazy beers so uh-huh. Uh-huh. and she's a fair amount um and i would i would throw out a little uh Recommendation for the uh, Brewer's Friend uh, water calculator, actually, I think it's pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. free one, it's on their website, um, and it'll actually save your, your water calculations for you. You can email the links around to people, so that's a pretty good one. Um, that's one that I've used and enjoy, and uh, it's, it's got most of the minerals in there. It's, yeah, it's got some profiles that you can, uh, you can uh, lean on if you just start now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. With that that wheat um, profile, it's uh, you've got the choices of obviously starting off with your your a much earlier mashing schedule. But I'm the same as you, Jamil. I I like the simple the simplification of the the mashing profile and just a single infusion rest. Right. And I've done um, both uh, commercially uh, dark wheat beers and light wheat beers um, using both rest schedules and in uh, market testing of those we haven't been actually been able to get someone to distinguish them um, mm-hmm. the only thing i have found when you don't do the lower um, rest schedule is that later on in packaging the uh, compounds if your uh, phenolic estuary um, compounds tend to turn into a little bit more vanilla type character and that's not such a terrible thing in in some of those beers as well so um right. yeah 
Interesting. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Mark asks, he says, what the re- refractometer? He says, uh, his problem is inconsistent readings between hydrometer and refractometer. What's the proper process to ensure the same reading on the two devices? I frequently, but not always, experience up to 10 points of difference between the refractometer and hydrometer readings, with the refractometer typically being higher. Uh, This has happened often enough that even if they come out the same, I no longer have confidence in the readings. Both devices have been calibrated and show 1.000 in distilled water. I've tried extra stirring to ensure a a homogeneous wart uh, before taking samples and cooled the samples to 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit before taking readings, but the problem persists. My best guess is that the samples on the refractometer experiences enough evaporation that it affects the density of the sample, but who knows, hopefully you. Uh, My gut says that the hydrometer is more trustworthy, but I am hesitant to make adjustments in process based on temperature adjustment charts and it takes too long ambiently uh, to cool to be useful. Uh, Certain usual platitudes here. I learned it from listening to you. You taught me everything I know about brewing. You guys and everyone else at the Brewing Network rock, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Mark well, from Portland. He's been brewing since 2013. I've listened to every episode of Brew Strong, the Jamel Show, Can You Brew It? Bring the Style, most more than once. John's Palmer's middle name is Dillinger. <laughs> News to um, me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, one is that, uh, yeah, the refractometer hydrometer thing, you can get a refractometer uh, dialed in to be the same as a hydrometer if you calibrate it for the uh, that specific beer. When the color of the beer changes, when the, when the grist of the beer changes, it, it's going to be off again. It's, um, you know, it, it, it tends to have, it, it, most of the refractometers have an issue with, uh, uh, I don't know, color of the beer or whatever. The other reason, because I guess sometimes it's low, sometimes it's correct. That would be what I'm saying, it's not going to be evaporation. You're just not getting enough evaporation to, to do that. One of the other possible problems is that he's putting the liquid on hot, the word on hot on yeah. the refractometer, and it's just too hot initially, and then it cools down, and maybe he's getting you know timing issues. I would cool the the work down before you put it on the refractometer. You can uh, put it in a, in a teaspoon and hold it against an ice cube, and that chills it down quite quickly and then put on your refractometer that might make it more consistent. Um, you want to make sure you're measuring at the same temperature. I know they have ATC, but all that is is just the mass of the refractometer kind of cools the drops down before you read it. And, you know, depending on how hot a day it is, things like that, that can also throw off your hydrometer sample. You got to make sure that that hydrometer that work is at exactly the right temperature for your hydrometer, or you need to use a correction chart. The other thing about hydrometers is if you've had a hydrometer for a long time, or even if it's brand new, that little paper sleeve that's in the, it has the readings on it, it can shift. So, you know, perhaps it wasn't in there correct to start with. Uh, Perhaps it's, you know, vibration has caused it to go off. But he said he's calibrated it to the water. If you calibrate your hydrometer at the right temperature with water, um, and and, any, doesn't even really need to be distilled water. It should be really close to correct and always correct. So um, yeah. I would trust that as long as your work is at the correct temperature. And then the refractometer, again, for different beers, you know, if you're brewing a bunch of pale beers. That's what I found. It always seemed to vary a lot based off of the color of the work, which um, does and doesn't make sense. Um, you know, because it is, it is, uh, you know, light. Uh, and yeah, predominantly sugar. I got one, one suggestion. Uh, calibrate with 10 and 15% by weight sugar solutions. Mm-hmm. Sugar, sucrose, table sugar. Very easy to make up with a gram scale. And that gives you, you know, that precise, you know, 
uh, 10 Plato, 15 Plato, 1040, you know, uh, 1060 hydrometer readings to uh, to check on. You know, it's not just the water uh, measurement. There you go. That's and maybe you've got a buddy who's got a um, refractometer as well, and then uh, get him to bring his round. And see if you've got the same same issues. At least you've got, uh, you know, um, like for like work, and then you can then, you know, compare compare your uh, refractometers. Mm -hmm. There you go. That sounds like a good advice for uh, Mark in Portland. Yep, or Marks anywhere. By the way, tour tour mittens, um, Menton, Mertens, there we go, not mittens. Mertens in the chat says he would advise usage of uh, chelators, uh, tannic acid, or elegic acid as antioxidants. He was uh, expressed concern that ascorbic acid can act as a pro-oxidator uh, rather as an antioxidant as well. And I'm I'm not familiar with that aspect of it. Neither am I. Um, and again, I think the, the thing is proper process. You can get really low DOs, uh, in beer. It, it doesn't take a whole lot. And I think, you know, the advantage of home brewing is, um, you know, you're working on, you know, vessels that can be, you know, sealed and moved and you have a lot more, uh, options than you do commercially. So, um, uh, it can be even easier. Uh, brew system change, Ryan. Well, let's see here. Let's take one more short break, and when we come back, we'll we'll finish up with Ryan's question right after this. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. We're uh, here with uh, Nick Galton Fenzi and uh, buddy uh, John Pollard. And uh, just so you know, Nick is a, uh, a brewery consultant work, working around the world uh, in uh, a number of great breweries. And if you're listening live, stay tuned because uh, we're going to delve into that in the next uh, episode and you get a chance to ask him questions uh, about, uh, you know, to anything about breweries. Yeah, I, I got some questions for him. I got, I, I got, I got questions for him. And crocodiles. <laughs> Let's see. But, uh, uh, here, Ryan has this question um, about changing his brew system. He says, hello, my grandmother gave me $150 after I passed the bar exam 11 years ago. I used to buy my first brewing kit and I've been home brewing since. I found your show shortly thereafter and I'm sure it along with the other shows on the BN is the reason I am able to brew tolerable beer today. So thanks for all that you do. I'm on the fence on a brewing system change and hope one of you might nudge me in a direction. A current system is pictured below. He's got a picture of a, uh, uh, a flat uh, three side-by-side -side vessel. Um, Pumped. Uh, he's got uh, pumps and uh, a, a, like a Blick, Blickman plate chiller, it looks like. Um, it was built for me by a guy who did welding work for local breweries. I like it, but I honestly don't use it as intended. I basically do a brew in a bag batch sparge where I load the mash tun with my total water. At the end of the mash, I recirculate for a bit until the work runs clear, then run it off into my boil kettle. I principally use the third vessel to heat water and sanitize equipment throughout the process, mainly the heat exchanger. I started brewing this way shortly after I had my first daughter three years ago because it saves on time. My efficiency is horrible, 55%, but that doesn't bother me so much. I add more grain and supplement with DME where needed. Yeah. Uh, as my daughters, now two of them, get older, I've been considering a change to a system that takes up less space in the garage as their stuff slowly takes over the garage. I was looking at the Blickman Brew Easy because my current method of brewing is essentially what the Brew Easy does. The right. Brew Easy has a fraction of the footprint. This is what I'm struggling with and thought you might be able to provide input. I know that John has played a lot on the Brew Easy and Jamel has daughters. And so <laughs> you've probably seen the progression of garage space limiting and the freeing as they move up and out. 
I know a three vessel system is probably more versatile in the long run. So I'm going to kick myself 15 years down the road wishing I had kept this. Or is the brew easy versatile enough that I won't really care? John? Well, I, I think I think it is fairly easy to answer. Um, yes, the brew easy will fill uh, that void adequately, fill those shoes. Um, John Blick, Blickman himself does all of his brewing on the brew easy uh, at home. And uh, yeah, footprint, um, ease of use, one less vessel to clean up. Um, less tubing to clean up afterwards um, makes a big difference in the brew day. Um, and uh, I, I like, uh, I like the brew easy, you know, with the, with the larger size, um, you know, so you can do, you know, you can easily do a seven gallon boil for five gallon batch in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. 220. It, it boils quickly. Um, no, no waiting around. Um, yeah, good system. Well, Nick, you started out as a home brewer. What, what kind of equipment did you have back then? A rock um, and, uh, <laughs> and a stick. It uh, wasn't far, far beyond that. Actually, it was um, pretty much as described and as advertised. Um, the initial, I was again. Um, brewing bag and that's that's how i i sort of started um, beyond kit and kilos where it's originally but um, then for grain brewing here yeah, brewing bag it's a very simple system it's very cheap it's very um cost effective as far as production goes you can um, make quite a lot of mistakes and um, you haven't spent a lot of money in order to um, build your build your uh, equipment up and there's a, there's a lot of really good all-in-one systems now. Um, they have their own uh, grain baskets and uh, they are very, very easy to use. So um, I'd investigate some of some of those systems as well. There is a lot of forums that are out there for brewers um, um, dedicated to each one of those systems. So ask some questions and uh, I see probably at least one question a day on those forums pitting head to head against each one of those systems and saying which one's better, which one um, is easier and you get your staunch supporters from both sides on, on each one of those systems. But I, I, I do a lot of my training um, for staff on an all-in-one system and uh, you know, I, I can't recommend them enough. They are very, very easy to use. A compact, um, I can take it on a train with me. So it's, uh, it is quite, uh, quite handy as far as that goes. So, um, yeah, yeah. I do recommend recirculation as opposed to non recirculation, mm -hmm. um, especially when you get into larger grain bills. That recirculation helps maintain a very homogeneous temperature throughout the bed, um, you know, moving you away from any problems with. Uh, lack of conversion or lack of rinsing um, and so on. I mean, Bruna bag is very simple and it does work, um, but his the, the efficiency he cited at 55 is a little low. I would expect uh, would, to see something more like 75, even with brewing a bag. Yeah, and it might, might be crush related, might be could be crush related, but it might be, you know, uh, a num number of things. Yeah. And, and recirculation might address some of that. Well, and, and for me, you know, uh, I would, uh, I would, you know, I think kind of the key thing here is, you know, have fun with home break. You know, it should be uh, something you enjoy and you don't have to do, uh, you know, three, you know, vessel, all grain, you can do whatever is enjoyable to you, you know, uh, save yourself some space and some time enjoy it with your your daughters they're going to grow up faster than than you know and uh then you'll be uh you know instead of worrying about the the brew system you got rid of you'll be worrying more about the time that you didn't have with your kids so uh, okay. i think that's that's where to focus sounds like you should simplify is is our recommendation and uh yeah have fun with it have fun with brewing enjoy yeah. it the the Gross difference between you know a simplified brewing and complex brewing is really not that much in quality of beer. So 
uh, but quality of time, quality of life could be could be important. All right, that's all we have for this show. If you stay tuned, if you're listening live, stay tuned. We're going to take a few minutes to, um, you know, go grab a beer, do a potty break, uh, whatever it is. And then we're going to be back with Nick. And uh, he has an interesting story about his, his progression uh, uh, to where he is today. And I thought it would be kind of fascinating uh, for people that envision themselves uh, on a similar track to, uh, to, to hear uh, his, his stories and uh, his lessons uh, through life <laughs> as, a, as a brewer. So um, make sure you support our, our fine sponsors, our main sponsors, uh, Blickman Engineering and uh, Brew Chatter. Uh, just throw a dot .com on the end and, and you're there. I, how you spell Blickman, I don't really know. Or engineering, I, I can't spell any of those things. Uh, but uh, you'll find them on the on the Google web. You just you know uh, type something in, click 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 click, and, and, and you're there. Uh, so everybody, uh, stay tuned if you're listening live. If you're not, uh, that show will be posted in a couple of weeks. Uh, until then, everybody, you're strong.